Hello, this is Dennis Helsel, and welcome to this month's webinar, which is titled, Which of These Things is Not Like the Others? So let's get started this morning. How do multiple comparison tests work? Why would we use them? So how and why are really the main point of the main objective for this webinar. But I do want to uh, get you familiar with one particular type of multiple comparison test because it's fairly new and it new in statistical sense. So it's been, it's been uh, developed in the last 20 years. That's what I mean by new in a statistics world. And it takes a while for the information from these kinds of developments to get over into the environmental science community. That's one of the reasons for uh, the webinars that I do, for the classes that I do, is to try to familiarize people with newer methods. And this will be one of them today, something called the false discovery rate and why you should use that. And it is recommended for use in the new second edition of Statistical Methods in Water Resources. Uh, before you get too excited, it's not yet released by the USGS. However, I have seen some recent uh, indications that it is, in fact, coming soon. You can find it. You can download it. It's going to be a free PDF, and you could download it from this link. It's our books page on the website. Uh, when that comes out, you can also get it from the USGS's publications page when it comes out, but it is not there today. And this is one of the new items in here. So uh, some of the webinars I have been doing are out of this book. Some of the webinar, webinars have been out of the courses, in particular the non-detects and data analysis course that's up on our training page. All right, so what are multiple comparison tests used for? They're used for a number of different things in environmental science. What's new since the 1950s, 60s? And how do they work? And particularly, how does this false discovery rate procedure work? Why it's important. So that's where we're going. Uh, I'm going to try to do a poll first. So this is the poll. Uh, the title comes from a song. And the question is, where do you think that song came from? So it's going to give you five options. You can choose one of them. It should be showing up now on your screen. So you can select one from Billy Joel, from Sesame Street, from ABBA, from The Cat in the Hat, and from Bill Nye the Science Guy. So all of these are go back a few years, but so does this song. So here's the results. Most everyone says Sesame Street, and that is the correct answer. So the others weren't too inventive, but um, it's the best I could do. So, so why should we use multiple comparison tests? When are they used? Well, I can think of uh, three very quick examples. The first is perhaps the most common after you do a test for group differences, so something like analysis of variance or the Kruskal-Wallis test. And those tests do not determine which groups differ from others. They are just telling you that there is some difference between the means for ANOVA or the cumulative distribution function, the CDF, the set of percentiles for the Kruskal-Wallis test. And so it doesn't tell you anything other than there is at least one difference. And so you'd like to know often which groups differ from others. And so that can be done with multiple comparison tests. They will run a series of two group tests. So for analysis of variance, to follow up that, it's t-tests. For the Kruskal-Wallis test, to follow up that, it's the rank sum tests. These are tests to compare two different groups, and it will run a series of those to determine which ones differ from the other. And the reason why you don't just do t-tests or the rank sum tests by themselves is that what we want to do is control or set the probability of making at least one error in the whole pattern when we're done. So when we get done and say that group A is bigger than group B and C and C is greater than D, 
that pattern. We want to minimize the error in that pattern. And so that's what multiple comparison tests do. More generally, they allow you to set an overall rate of error when you're doing multiple tests. So as a second example in groundwater, um, these days uh, there's a lot of site characterization and, and monitoring at sites where they're having to measure various chemicals that are not good in the groundwater and there are legal standards that they should not exceed. And so there's tests. So perhaps there would be 10 different chemicals that are being evaluated and at eight different wells over a site. Well, if each chemical is tested at each well, that's 80 tests. And so if each of those tests were run with the traditional alpha level of 0.05, the traditional 5% cutoff that would define significance, then there's a, with 80 of those, there's a 98% probability, so essentially certain, that at least one test was a false positive. And that false positive does lead to additional uh, collection of data and falsely sometimes requiring remediation. So the idea is to minimize this um, false positive kind of procedure. And you can do that to some extent with multiple comparison tests. So again, what these comparison tests do is if you set the overall probability of making a false positive, the probability of declaring there's a difference when there is not, then, um, and you set that, let's say at 0.05, 5%, then the tests themselves are run at a smaller alpha level, something smaller than 0.05, the individual two-group tests. And we'll talk about that in detail. There are other situations where there's multiple tests being run as a group. And again, the overall error rate can be set with a multiple comparison test. And it also then, what it does is tell you the correct in order to get that overall error rate, the correct alpha level for each of the individual tests. And so sometimes we do a lot of trend tests, maybe at multiple sites, so that we wanna say, is there a trend over this entire region? And we've got 10 sites, and maybe we're doing that again for um, eight different um, chemicals. So a collection of sites, a collection of chemicals, collection of seasons, and you've got these um, multiple tests and what you're interested in is not making more than a certain percent error overall and you're also interested in stating something about each of the individual tests and so if that's the case then the multiple comparison kind of procedure is what you want to use So the goal of multiple comparison tests is to determine whether there are signals, differences between pairs of groups or any significance test, test like a trend test for a collection of these tests and control or set the error rate for the entire group. So I'm gonna give an example where there were six groups. When there are six groups, there are 15 tests that are performed between all the pairs of groups. So testing group A to group B, testing group B to group C, et cetera. So they, at the end, we want to know a pattern of which groups differ from the others. Uh, and that whole pattern is what the goal is. And so we want to know what error is there in that entire pattern that we're declaring is true. So an overall pattern uh, error rate, it's often called just the overall error rate. It's sometimes called the family error rate, is the error rate that there's no more than a certain percent chance, maybe 5% or whatever you choose, of making at least one error in that pattern. So here are six groups. These are iron concentrations in streams that were measured years ago. And the Kruska-Wallis test says there are significant differences among these. So their percentiles, as shown by these box plots, are not all the same. They look different. So we'd like to know, well, which ones are different than others? 
that's the multiple comparison test procedure because we're going to have to take each box, each group here, and compare it to all the other boxes. So if we have K groups, and the example here, K was six, if we have K groups, the number of pairwise comparisons, two group comparisons, group A versus group B, group B versus group C, et cetera, there are K times K minus one over two comparisons. So for a K of six groups, there's 15 tests that are run. So each of these tests, that 15 is called C here, the number of comparisons, C is standing for comparisons. If each of these tests are run using an individual error rate or a pairwise error rate, those are the two terms that you see. So each test is run with an alpha of 0.05. Then there's an overall error rate, the chance of it making at least one error in that entire pattern. That's much higher. And with 15 tests, that error rate's gonna be 54%. There's a 54% probability that you've made at least one error in saying a false positive or a false negative. And the equation is there, the one minus quantity, one minus alpha for the pairwise, the individual tests, so uh, raised to the C power. So this was uh, recognized and um, methods were developed Generally, in the 1960s, one of the leaders in raising this issue and developing methods for it was a statistician Olive Dunn. And in the 60s, she developed a multiple comparison test to follow ANOVA and follow the Kruska Wallace test. And the 64 method with the Kruska Wallace test was really has been the standard procedure for non parametric tests until fairly recently. So uh, I believe Minitab still uses it as its standard multiple comparison test to follow up Kruska Wallace. Did last time I checked anyway. So these tests um, have been around for a while. They let you set the overall error rate, say to 5%. And then what it does is do these individual pairs of groups, test those at an alpha level for those individual tests that is smaller than 0.05. And so as these have changed over the years, it's been because people have become better and better at figuring out what these individual error rates must be for the pairs of groups in order to end up with an overall error rate of what you want. So here's a simple example. It's the oldest one. It's called Bonferroni's adjustment. And these methods have nothing to do with parametric tests or non-parametric tests. They're simple, simply ways to adjust the alpha levels for a test. So they can be used for parametric methods like ANOVA and t-tests, or they can be used for non-parametric methods as well. All right, so Bonferroni's adjustment is just taking the overall alpha level and dividing it by C, the number of comparisons that are gonna be computed. So if, e, if you wanted an overall error rate of 0.05, you don't want more than a 5% chance of making an error in that pattern, then you divide 0.05 by 15, and the alpha level for each of these individual tests would be 0 0.0033. That's a pretty small number, but that's the number that you would use, the cutoff that you would use when you ran a whole series of let's say rank some tests following up the Kruska Wallace test. So comparing group one versus group two, group one versus group three, versus group four versus group five versus group six, et cetera. Each of those would be run. You get a p-value back for them. If that p-value was less than 0 0.0033, then you would say there's a significant difference. And if it was above 0 0.0033, you would say there was not a significant difference, not at the level that would allow you to control the error rate for the whole pattern as 0 0.05. You can see that's pretty restrictive. There are better methods these days, but just as an illustration is that if I ran these, uh, which I did the uh, individual rank sum tests following the Kruska Wallace, the individual rank sum tests, all 15 of them, and listed them out from the highest p-value on the left side to the smallest p-value on the right side. The highest p-value was one, it's the far left column. 
underneath that for the next pairwise comparison, the next highest p-value is 0.644 then 397 and so on, going all the way down to the rightmost column where underneath of P it says that the last two were 0. 0.0000 and whatever numbers came from after that followed four zeros, so they were very small. So those are the p-values for the individual tests, and that's exactly what you'd get back if you ran a rank sum test on just these two groups data. Then you'd compare those to the Bonferroni limit, which is listed next to each of those p-values of 0 0.0033. And if any of them were less than 0 0.0033, you would declare them to be significant. So by the Bonferroni adjustment, there would be four, these are the ones on the right-hand side, four tests, so four group comparisons that were significant. And by doing this, we could say that overall, there's no more than a 5% chance making an error when stating that this pattern is correct. So a picture of those results uh, could be like this. This is the Bonferroni results. What the differences are, three of the differences are between the red boxes that are lie towards the top and the blue box, which is at the bottom. And the purple are kind of blends in between. And so they're not really significant from the adjacent ones. Blue is not different from purple. Red is not different from purple, but blue is different from red. And so you've got three of the four that way. Anyway, there is one purple to blue difference that is also significant. That was the four by Bonferroni. All right, so we can see some differences, but not a whole lot. So that was the oldest procedure. A newer procedure, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. It has been standard until recently, probably the most commonly one used now until recently, this one and Tukey's, which is simply for a parametric approach. A Tukey's method is doing a series of adjusted t-tests, so it only works for the parametric case. So Holm uh, is used for, can be used for either parametric or non-parametric. And so here's how you would do the home adjustment. This has been an improvement over Bonferroni. And what you do here is take that overall error rate alpha and divide it by C, the number of comparisons minus I, where I is just the, the ordering, the rank of these comparisons. So it's just the numbers one through 15. Or actually it's the numbers 14 through zero for this one. And so it's alpha divided by C minus I, starting at the top where it's C minus one. So in other words, uh, when you look at the leftmost columns and the first P value is a value of one, that's the, what the result was for the test when you just ran it um, with the two groups, the rank sum test, you're going to compare it to a limit that's 0.05 times one over one or 0.05. For the 0.644, I'm going to compare that to a limit of 0 0.050 times 1 over 2. The next one will be 1 over 3, 1 over 4, all the way down to the lower left side, where these low p values are compared to a limit that's 1 over 15 at the bottom times 0 0.05, which is again that 0033 that the Bonferroni used. But between 0 0.05 and 0.0033, there are values going down, uh, but they're not all the same number. And so by doing that, there's a greater possibility to um, see differences that are there. And the ed what Holm did was to show mathematically that this still controls the overall error rate at 0.05. So this is the Holm adjustment, and you can find that in software pretty commonly. And this shows five differences instead of four. So some advantage over the Bonferroni procedure. The earliest methods, the ones that I learned when I was a boy, uh, back in the 1950s and 60s, was uh, there were some names, Duncan's and the least significant range test and a few others. And these only set the individual error rates. These were just doing a series of these pairwise tests. The software just did all 15 for you, but they were just straight t-tests. And so 
um, they set the individual error rate at 0.05, which meant the point the overall error rate was much higher than you'd expect. And so those are not really used anymore. Then the later sequence, which includes Tukey's test, the parametric test that's uh, and Dunn's procedures following ANOVA are parametric procedures. Um, just as a note, so if so, he's doing something that is specifically a parametric procedure, whether you're using the home adjustment or any of the other adjustments we're talking about, there's still versions of t-tests. And so they are going to lose the ability to see differences if the data are not following a normal distribution. And the problem, if you have, have data in 15 different comparisons, so in six different groups, is they all have to be. They all have to be a normal distribution. And you can't take the logs of one group and not take the logs of another group. So with transformations, you'd have to do the same thing to all of the groups. So there's some limitation there, and it often leads to some loss of power, ability, powers, the ability to see differences. All right, the third bullet, uh, controlling the overall error rate costs power. Also, if the adjustment, and here Bonferroni's is the best example, is not very efficient at getting down to those individual error rates. It push them, pushes them really small, and then it's hard to see differences. So Holmes and some of the later versions have been better than Bonferroni's for sure. However, still, there are cases where people are making a lot of comparisons and um, some genomics work looking at gene characteristics is one of the more recent examples where they might make hundreds of comparisons, maybe thousands of comparisons. And yet they still want to have some semi-controllable number for overall, how likely is it that I've, I've um, made a mistake in one of these comparisons, because it may be pretty important when you're talking about gene characteristics. So a Bonferroni adjustment, certainly even the Holmes adjustment would require pretty small pairwise error rates. And so pretty unlikely to see those differences. So somewhat in response to this, although it really, it really predated most of this kind of work in genomics, it was back in 1995. There were two scientists, Benjamini, Benjamini and Hochberg, who um, came up with something new called the false discovery rate. And it's what we recommend using for most environmental purposes as well. What it does is a subset of the overall error rate kind of procedure. It's going to set a probability for overall making at least one false positive. So that's one of the two types of errors you could make, either a false positive or a false negative. So the false discovery rate minimizes or sets one of those, not the other. The benefit, though, by doing this is that you get a pretty large gain in the power of seeing differences as compared to the overall error rate. So as compared to even Holmes or some of the other adjustments that are more modern. So this increase in power enables you to see more differences that are there in the individual pairwise comparisons. It doesn't control the number of false no differences, but, but uh, it, there, if it finds more differences, it's going to have it's going to state fewer no differences. And so in that sense, it also controls the number of, it not controls, but it uh, minimizes at least statements of false no difference because it's finding more differences than the other procedures do. So overall, it's a very worthwhile thing to do. And I'll just give you an example of that. Here's how the false discovery rate works. It looks a lot like that Holmes procedure. If you want to set the overall error rate to 0.05, I should call that the false discovery rate now to 0.05. It's still an overall type of procedure, but it's only minimizing the false positives. You could lay them out on a 
grid like this if you were doing this by hand, just like it was before, where the highest p-values are to the left and the lowest p-values for these tests that you're running individually are to the right. And then um, comparing those to uh, taking your overall false discovery rate and multiplying it by a ratio I divided by C. C is still the number of comparisons, so it's going to be 15 here. I is just going to be counting them, and the counting is going from the top end, 15, down to 1 at the low end. So for the first comparison where P is equal to 1 on the top left of the table, you're comparing that to 15 over 15 times 0.05 or a 0.05. So if the p-value were less than 0.05, which it's not, it would be significant. The second one, 0.64, is compared to a p-value that's 0.05 times 14 divided by 15, or 0.047. And the next one would be 13 over 15, which works out to be 0.043 when you multiply it times 0.05, and so on. All the way down till we get to some pretty small cutoffs. These are um, the alpha levels, and they are for the individual comparisons on the right-hand side, the last four there on the last column, which are in red, is 0 0.013, 0 0.010, 0 0.007, and 0 0.0033. Okay, so by doing this and comparing what we've observed, because the cutoffs are higher than they were before, we see more differences. And so in this case, the ones that are in red are the ones that are significant. For example, the first significant one is the p-value that's 0.025. It's in the second column from, second set of columns from the left. So that first one, 0.025, was compared to an alpha level of 0.03, and it is less than 0.03, so it's significant. So you can see by these um, procedures that what we're doing is setting alpha levels which vary for the individual pairwise comparisons. And when the p-value from the test, the pairwise test, the two-group test, is smaller than this adjusted alpha level, we declare those groups to be different. So here, if we can just say I'm only interested in Minimizing the false positives, we see nine, not four or five, nine differences. Still at an overall false statement rate, false statement as far as these that I've declared to be significant are really not significant. So that false positive, that's still set at an overall rate, false discovery rate of 0.05. Here's just some pictures to give it back to get back to reality here. Uh, with the BH adjustment, these were six of the nine tests that were found to be different, and I just picked them the first six I came to. I can only fit six on one slide, so here they are. And you can see for all of them that they look pretty different. The box plots look pretty different. And you would, in looking at them, say, yeah, these two sets of percentiles look like they're different in the two groups. Here are the six tests that found no difference with the BH adjustment, and five of them look like there is no difference between them. One that I've highlighted in the red background does look like there's a difference. This was the test that was right on the edge. Um, the p-value was 0.038, the cutoff was 0.033, so it just barely is above it. That just reinforces the somewhat arbitrariness of saying 0.05. 0.05, there's nothing magic about it. Um, if you had said you wanted a 0.06, then that group that was in the red there would be probably significant. And so, um, you know, there's nothing magic about 0.05. But so here we have the six that are not different at an alpha overall false discovery rate of 0.05. All right, so the last topic is to talk about how these tests report back their results to you. And the important thing is, and this is standard in software these days, 
for the benefit of running all 15 tests with one command, what it's going to do, and it really is another benefit, I guess, is it's going to rescale the p-values from each of these group tests before it reports them back to you so that you can compare them and say which ones are different and which ones are not, which ones are significant and which ones are not. It's going to rescale them back to your overall false discovery rate or overall error rate, say 0.05. And that would be the default in software, but you can change that. So the individual p-values for the 15 tests that were compared to Bonferroni's alpha level of 0.05 divided by 15, the 0 0.0033, those p-values, which come out of rank sum tests, those p-values are then multiplied by 15 before they report them back to you. So a p-value that was just underneath 0 0.0033, maybe it was 0 0.0030, would then be multiplied by 15 and reported to you. So there was one of them that had a p-value of 0 0.0016. That was the result from the test between the two groups. And that was less than 0 0.0033, so it was significant. That was the highest p-value of the four significant ones. So when it's reported back to you, that value of 0 0.0016 would be multiplied by 15 and reported back to you as 0.024. You would look at the result, you would say 0.024, oh, that's less than my overall 0.05, so that's significant. So that's what they do when they report them back to you. With the BH procedure, they're going to just take the inverse of the fraction that was used to adjust that false discovery rate. So back in, Let's go back to this slide. The fraction that's right next to 0 0.05 for each of these, just flip that top to bottom and you've got the factor that's going to be multiplied by the p-value to give you what's reported back to you. Again, that allows you then to compare them to 0 0.05 or whatever your overall rate is, and then say, are these individual tests significant or not? So there was one, I guess one p-value that was 0 0.0256. It was the highest of the p-value of the significant ones. So it placed number nine. So that was the 0 0.05 was multiplied by nine over 15. So the software then takes a ratio of 15 divided by nine, multiplies that times the p-value of 0 0.0256 and gives you back on the output a p-value of 0 0.04. And you compare that to your false discovery rate of 0 0.05 and say, oh, these look different. So that's those adjusted p-values are what is reported back to you in things like this, a triangular matrix of p-values. So let me come back to that and go back to the previous slide just for a second. So what is happening here is it's going to take the observed p-values, the p-values from those two group tests, which were the leftmost columns in the set of columns. So the values for one, then 0 0.644, then 397, then 270, moving over to the second set of columns, the 0 0.0544, then 0 0.0378, etc. Taking those, multiply them by the appropriate ratio. It's 15 for Bonferroni, and gives you what I've put in the column called reported here. So what was 0 0.0016 on the right-hand side, the highest up red colored p-value, 0 0.0016, that was the first one by Bonferroni that was significant. Multiply that 0 0.0016 times 15, you get 0 0.0240. When you get the output here, you'll see the one that has the asterisk next to it is that same one, 0 0.0240. So that's what you get back when you run these tests. And that was the Bonferroni adjustment, the similar kind of thing for the BH adjustment. We're gonna take the same observed p-values from the tests and multiply them by some ratio. And that gets printed out here when we tell it to adjust by the BH method.
And these red numbers are the nine pairwise comparisons that are significantly different, keeping the overall false discovery rate at 0.05. And so the results of this BH um, differs from Bonferroni in those middle boxes that were covered colored purple before. They're now colored just kind of a beige or light brown. And that's because they are hard breaks. They are significant. All the red is significant from all the beige and all the beige is significant from the blue. So with those nine differences, we basically can tell everything apart other than if they are in the same color. So we get more clarity with the BH type of adjustment. And you get the same thing back, same type of thing with Holmes. Again, I'm not going to, to go into the detail of how that works, but it's the same kind of thing. So where can you get these? Well, using R, you can uh, do commands to follow up the Kruskal-Wallis test with pairwise.wilcox.test. So that's going to do all pairwise, all two groups uh, with the rank sum test. And then specify what P adjustment method you want. I believe the default is Holmes, if I remember correctly. And so I designate it here as the BH adjustment to get that false discovery rate. Same thing is you could do that with t-tests and get all the possible t-tests after an ANOVA with the BH adjustment. The Holmes adjustment and the Tukey's adjustment are often pretty similar. The BH would likely find a few more differences than Tukey's does. And then if you were in one of the webinars a few months ago, we talked about comparing groups for data with non-detects that is up on our training site. You can go and see it there for free. But there's a command called send one way in the commands that are part of our online course that uh, will do this all possible comparisons and use the BH adjustment to find out which groups are different from others. So which of these things is not like the others? Uh, multiple comparison tests determine which groups differ from others. So again, if you were comparing all of these 80 tests in a groundwater site, 10 chemicals at eight sites, uh, eight different wells, it would tell you which wells have a significant um, exceedance of a standard and which wells do not. So you're interested in the individual pattern which is which is are higher, which are lower, but controlling the overall rate of making a false statement with the overall error rate, like with Holmes, or controlling the false statement that we see a difference when there really is not one. So a false rejection of the null hypothesis, that's the false discovery rate. And so um, that would be the type of situations where these tests would excel and should be used. The reported p-values are scaled by software so they can be directly compared to your overall error rate or your false discovery rate. And using the false discovery rate does provide more ability to see differences for very little cost is my statement here. That's what most people consider because they primarily are interested in they're primarily worried about saying there's a false difference when there really is no difference. If that's the case for you, use the false discovery rate. If you are, um, if you need to worry about both false positives and false negatives, you could use one of the traditional adjustments and HOLM, H-O-L-M is probably the most powerful of the ones that are commonly available. In R, there's about 10 different ones that are available. In other software, you likely get a, a fewer choices, but still three or four. So uh, just see what you have in the software that you're using. And that's the end of the uh, webinar, other than I'm going to respond to some questions. So if you haven't already, go ahead and type some questions in. All right. so. This material from today was in the new book, Statistical Methods and Water Resources, second edition, that will be out 
soon. So with that, I am going to take a look at the questions. Let's see what I can come up with here. All right. David says, can you provide a recommendation for multiple comparison tests with sensor data results? Well, I would do the BH adjustment. If you have that available to you, that's the most powerful thing that I know of to date. And if it's not available to you, or if you want to not only just minimize false positives, but both positives and negatives, then I'd probably use the Holmes test. So that's the homes, they're not really tests, they're adjustments, the homes, home adjustment, and which would be pretty equivalent to Tukey's test if you were doing parametric kinds of procedures. Okay. How do BH adjusted probabilities apply in a posteriority a posteriori tests, multiple range tests like Tukey's, et cetera. Well, there it's an alternative to those. So um, in concept, it's uh, you don't do both. You don't adjust those procedures. You're adjusting the underlying tests that those t t procedures are based on. So the ones that you've mentioned, Tukey's, the LSD, the Duncan's, those are all basically t-tests. And they did some adjustment to the t-test. BH is an alternative adjustment to the t-tests. So it's just a way of changing the alpha levels for the individual tests. All of these are just that. So you would use BH instead of one of those other ones. Again, I'll just warn you that the LSD and Duncan's don't really adjust and to give you an overall procedure. So um, they're basically just t-tests. Just the software that did all 15, if that's what you had, t-tests. So um, Tukey's did do an adjustment and for a t-test based procedure, Tukey's has about the most power. It would be very similar to home adjustment. Can I provide the full citation for the BH test? I will put that in the answers. It's an article in a statistics journal in 1995 by Benjamini and Hochberg. But if you just um, did a search, a browser search for the term false discovery rate, I'm sure you would find it very quickly. Will the slides be available? Yes, they are gonna be on our downloads page in, by Thursday. Um, does the order of comparison matter when using tests with changing p-value criteria? The order of, of these tests, the way that it assigns the alpha level, which is what's changing, to the p-values that you get with the two group tests, the order is always from high to low in terms of those p-values. So you run all of the 15 tests just as you would if you had put each one of them into the software for either a t-test or a rank sum test. Get back that p-value. Take those 15 p-values, order them from high to low, and then using the table kind of approach that I showed you, figure out what the corresponding alpha level is that is changing, unless you're doing Bonferroni's, which I hope you don't, which does not change. It's just dividing by the number of comparisons. All right, can you re-explain the difference between the overall error rate and the false discovery rate? And um, the overall error rate is the probability of observing at least one false test result. It could be a false positive, it could be a false negative. The false discovery rate is setting the probability of seeing a false positive a false rejection of the null hypothesis when it's not really any difference. If you're doing this with a whole series of trend tests, it would be the probability of, it would be the false, the rate of falsely declaring there was a trend when there was no trend. So the false discovery rate is a subset of the overall error rate. One of the two possible things that goes into an overall error rate, which is a false positive and a false negative, setting the false discovery rate is just setting the false positive rate. 
So it does presume that false negatives aren't as much of a concern. And partly that's true because you then see more positives. You see more differences than you could with the other adjustments. Uh, let's see. Is the false discovery rate similar to what some folks call beta, the probability of a type 2 error? No, it's entirely different. Beta is the type 2 error. Um, it's it's the, um, the other part that the false discovery rate is not considering. It's the probability of a false negative. So beta is 1 minus the power. The power is the ability to see things that are there, to see differences or see trends that are there. The beta error rate, the type 2 error rate, is when you do not see something that is in fact there. So they are different. Is the iron concentrations original data set available for practice? It is part of our applied environmental statistics course, has been for years. Kelly, I, I don't remember. I do remember some names of past students, but there have been thousands at this point over the years since I started teaching it. So uh, if you took the class, Applied Environmental Statistics, you already have it in the data that came with that class. If not, I'd be glad to send it to you. Just send me an email and I would be glad to do that. Ryan, your question, what are you looking at when you evaluate box plots? Let me try to answer that. If I don't answer it, if I don't understand your question correctly, send me an email and I'll get it answered correctly in what's going to be in the Excel file um, on our downloads page. So what are you looking at when you look at box plots? I look at the whole, whole box and the outliers because that's what a non-parametric test is evaluating. It's evaluating the set of percentiles. So something like a Kruskal-Wallis test is asking the question, not only are the medians all the same in each of the groups, but are the 25th percentiles all the same in each group, the 75th all the same in each group, is the set of percentiles the same in each group? That's what a Kruskal-Wallis test and other non-parametric tests like the rank sum tests are evaluating. So when I look at the box plots, I'm certainly looking at whether there's a shift. That's another way people explain non-parametric tests. It's a test for whether there's a shift so that one box is sitting up higher than the other box generally. There might be some overlap or not, but one is shifted higher compared to the other. So that's my view. If you need to know more than that, if I haven't understood it fully, send me an email quickly and uh, like sometime today before you forget, and then I will answer it in the file for, for Thursday. Okay, last question. For typical environmental contaminant data, do you recommend using a parametric test on log transformation or non-parametric methods? Sample size assumed to be 15 to 20 per group. Uh, I would generally recommend non-parametric methods. Why? Because, um, Parametric methods are, um, and in fact, what I would generally recommend might be neither of those two things. It would be what we're going to talk about in a future webinar called permutation tests. But so let me let me quickly answer the question. Parametric tests on log data are not testing means; they're testing medians. They're testing, to be more specific, geometric means. So once you transform the data, you're no longer transform. You're no longer testing for means in the original units. Non-parametric tests test for differences in not just medians, but again, the whole set of percentiles. So is there a shift? Uh, a good way of stating what a non-parametric test is testing, it's testing, is one group giving me bigger numbers than the other? That's what a non-parametric test almost literally tests for. Are the high values predominantly in one group versus the other group? That's what it's testing for. And I think that is what people are most often looking for, at least in the environmental sciences. I've got an upstream site and I've got a downstream site and I want to know whether the concentrations are higher downstream. That's exactly what a non-parametric test tests for.
But if you are interested in the parameter called the mean, parametric tests really have low power when the data are not a normal distribution. So there are new tests called permutation tests that test for differences in means, but do not require a normal distribution. So that's the subject of a future webinar. If that's of interest, tune in for that webinar. All right, I'm done. And if you want to know answers of the other questions, just go and grab that file by Thursday. It will be up on our downloads page. The PDF files for this webinar are going to be on that downloads page. And the webinar itself will be on our um, training site, practicalstats.teachable.com by Thursday, all of that. Thank you for attending. Maybe I'll see you next month, or at least hear you, and you'll hear me next month. Bye-bye.